Yeah, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to look back at the Newark and Detroit rebellions of 1967. It began in Newark on July 12th of 1967, when two white police officers arrested and beat an African-American cab driver. Protesters initially started gathering outside the 4th police precinct. Then the unrest spread. Over the next six days, 26 people died, 700 were injured. Entire city blocks were burned down. Then, on July 23rd, police officers raided an after-hours club in an African-American neighborhood of Detroit. That soon sparked another mass rebellion. Over the next five days, 43 people were killed—33 African-Americans and 10 white people—in the streets of Detroit. Thousands more were injured. Over 7,000 were arrested. More than 2,000 buildings were destroyed. Governor George Romney, the father of Mitt Romney, ordered the Michigan Army National Guard into Detroit, and President Johnson sent in both the 82nd and the 101st Airborne Divisions. At the height of the Detroit Rebellion on July 28, 1967, President Johnson appointed a National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders to investigate the root causes of the unrest. The final report, known as the Kerner Commission, famously concluded that the United States, quote, was moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal, unquote. The rebellions reshaped both Newark and Detroit and marked the beginning of an era of African-American political empowerment. Three years later, in 1970, Newark elected its first black mayor, Kenneth Gibson. Then, in 1974, Coleman Young became the first black mayor of Detroit. Today, the mayor of Newark is Ross Baraka, the son of the famed poet and writer Miri Baraka, who was arrested during the 1967 Newark Rebellion. This is the late Amiri Baraka in the 2007 documentary Revolution 67, speaking about what happened to him during the unrest 50 years ago. When I got home, suddenly little boys came around and said uh, they're breaking out windows on Springfield Avenue. And so, you know, I got my my brand new Volkswagen bus and went out, you know, actually to investigate. We took a guy to the hospital who had been shot. We mostly were riding around looking at how the what the police were doing. So finally, two o'clock in the morning, the bus got stopped. A bunch of policemen they pulled us out of the car and they proceeded to beat us up. They claimed they were on me. They claimed guns fell out of, you know, the dashiki I was wearing. Ironically, the guy who, who started was the guy I went to high school with. Because that's the first thing I said, hey, I know you. We went to high school, hit me in the, with the front end of his gun right in my head. Pew, it just sprouted all over. And I got beaten, beaten, beat. Um, I thought I was going to get killed, actually. But the people in the window start throwing stuff. First, it was brought to police headquarters. They kicked me in the, you know, genitals. They brought me in the Spina's office, threw me on the floor, and they said, uh, and Spina said, they got you. I mean, it was like a movie, you know. So I said, yeah, but I'm not dead. That was the late Amiri Baraka speaking in the 2007 documentary Revolution 67 from POV. To talk more about these two 1967 rebellions, we're joined by two guests. Larry Hamm with us, is with us in New York, longtime community organizer in Newark, chair of the People's Organization for Progress, organizes a commemoration of the Newark Rebellion every year. He was 13 at the age, at the time of the rebellion. And joining us from Detroit, Scott Kurashige, a professor of history at the University University of Washington. His latest book is The 50-Year Rebellion, How the U.S. Political Crisis Began in Detroit. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Larry, let's begin with you. You were 13. Describe. Um, we just heard Amiri Baraka. Uh, you were really a protege of yes, his. We yes, had you both on. Yes, uh, he on has since died on the 40th anniversary. Yes, yes. But describe your experience and the significance of what took place over those four days 50 on, years ago. On the night of July 12th, uh, 1967, 50 years ago, I was at my friend's house across the street from where I lived. And some of our other friends ran upstairs and said, Springfield Avenue is on fire. And we ran down the stairs to go to Springfield Avenue. But my mother, fortunately, was on the porch <laughs> at my house across the street. And she didn't let me go down. And she probably saved my life by doing so. Uh, I watched over the next uh, several nights uh, as the people rose up and um, it, it, within about three days, the National Guard rolled into Newark. Uh, 
the, the rebellion couldn't be put down by the 1,500-member uh, Newark police force. Uh, Governor Hughes ordered in 700 troopers. That wasn't enough. And then, finally, they called up the National Guard. I think 1,500 National Guardsmen came in. And I live near the corner of uh, 12th Street and 16th Avenue, and I actually watched the Guard roll up in our community. I didn't know at that time what the National Guard was. It looked like the Army to me. As far as I was concerned, it was the Army. Military trucks filled with soldiers, jeeps, uh, half-tracks, which are like small tanks for one person. And a state of emergency was declared, martial law was declared. We were under military occupation. And uh, a checkpoint was set up at that intersection. And the guard even uh, went door to door searching for contraband. For several days, we couldn't even leave our house to go get food until they uh, lifted the martial law. But um, it was something, it was an event that will never be forgotten. I will never forget it. And as much as people talk about property destruction, uh, which, which did occur, what also happened was a transformation of people's political consciousness. I believe, had it not been for the rebellion of 1967, Mayor Gibson wouldn't have been elected in 1970. It might have taken four years, maybe eight more years. Literally, a week after the rebellion, the Black Power Conference of 1967 was held in Newark, New Jersey. A year later, the Black Power Convention at West Kenny Junior High School. And a year after that, the Black and Puerto Rican Convention, out of which came the community's choice team. And in 70, we elected the first mayor, Kenneth A. Gibson, several councilmen, but we didn't get control of the city council. It took uh, another four years for a majority of blacks to get elected to the Newark City Council. Well, uh, I want to ask you, Larry, about that, uh, the results of, of the rebellion, because throughout the 1950s, in many of these cities, uh, especially in northern cities, mm -hmm. as more and more African Americans and Latinos came into the, into the cities, mm -hmm. there was enormous terror against uh, the uh, black and Latino community in, on behalf of whites who did not want people moving into their neighborhoods. So yes. this, in essence, these rebellions almost became a reaction to that terror that didn't get quite as much reporting, did it? The, the battles over housing right. that developed right. in the 40s and the 50s That's after right. the it's, war. It's the other side of the story of the civil rights movement that is never told. We focus, or I should say, the, the popular narrative deals mostly with the civil rights movement in the South. But there was a whole other movement going on in the North. We're talking today about Newark and Detroit. But many people don't know, in just those two years, 67 and 68, there were nearly 400 urban uprisings in the United States. Between 1960 and 1971, nearly a thousand urban uprisings. And I think that's left out of the popular narrative because it involved physical force. You know, it, 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 it was the establishment doesn't want to talk about that aspect of it. But yes, there was a shifting demographic going on in these urban areas. And the precipitating um, reason for the Newark riot, the— Police bo brutality. And talk about what actually happened with the cab driver. Right. Uh, John Smith was the cab driver. Uh, he was stopped by Newark police. He was beaten. Then he was taken to the police precinct on 17th Avenue. That precinct had a notorious reputation. Uh, and it, it was it sat in the heart of the Hayes Homes housing projects, 13 stories high. People could literally look out of their windows and look down. And they saw the police dragging Smith into the station. Many people thought he had been killed. Uh, civil rights groups, would had, which had been active in Newark, organized a protest in front of the police station that led to confrontation with the police. And that was the fuse that uh, lit And they the allowed dynamite. in black leadership to look at him. Yes. But they then saw that he was beaten, needed yes. hospital attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. They allowed him in. But it, the police didn't wait. There was disruption. They poured out into the street, and the confrontation with the protesters uh, led to the uprising. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. We're talking about Newark. We'll also talk about Detroit. Newark was first. Detroit was second. It was 50 years ago, the uprisings in both cities. We'll be back in a minute. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.
Well, on July 23, 1967, police officers raided an after-hours club in an African-American neighborhood of Detroit. That soon sparked uh, another mass rebellion. Uh, over the next five days, 43 people were killed in the streets of Detroit. Thousands more were injured. Over 7,000 were arrested. More than 2,000 buildings were destroyed. Uh, Governor George Romney, the father of Mitt Romney, ordered the Michigan Army National Guard into Detroit, and President Johnson sent in both the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Uh, joining us now is Scott Kurshige. He's a professor of history at the University of Washington, Bothell. His latest book is The 50-Year Rebellion, How the U.S. Political Crisis Began in Detroit. Uh, professor, uh, you argue that the Detroit uh, rebellion was a seminal moment in the uh, 20th century history of the United States. States. Could you talk about that and its impact uh, on the overall uh, national political scene? Sure. Thank you. You know, there's one sense that cities like Detroit and Newark were in great shape and that uh, the so-called riots destroyed these cities. And that's really a false narrative. The reality is that there were race, class, divisions uh, deeply rooted in these cities, and police brutality, as was already mentioned, was a deep structural problem. What the rebellions did, and, you know, people who participated in them definitely referred to them as rebellions, as did many people who lived in these cities. What the rebellions did was they forced the nation to confront these problems in the most substantial way for the first time. Martin Luther King said, a riot is the language of the unheard. He uh, worried that the problem was too many uh, large segments of white society care more about uh, tranquility and the status quo than justice and humanity. And he said, what we need to address is not just the violence, but the intolerant conditions that leave people with no alternative than to engage in violence to get attention. And so, the polarization that exists in our society today can be traced in many ways back to 67, but it's a polarization that has deep roots uh, in American history. And the polarization is really the result of us having to deal with these problems that were so many ways silenced for too many decades. And I want to ask you also about the because obviously Detroit was the center of the automobile industry at the time, and I guess the industry was at its height then. But there was also in the plants, in the auto plants, a gathering black workers movement, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, the Black Workers Congress, the impact that this rebellion in the auto industry had on uh, American capitalism. If you could uh, uh, talk about that as well. Absolutely. Detroit was at the forefront, of course, of the labor movement going back to the 1930s uh, and the establishment of the United Auto Workers. Detroit was at the center of the Northern Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther King marched with local civil rights leaders and 200,000 Detroiters in 1963, before the National March on Washington. And Detroit was, of course, at the forefront of the Black Power Movement. My mentor, Grace Lee Boggs, and her late husband, James Boggs, were at the center of that, along with uh, DRUM, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, uh, the Black Panther Party. Uh, I worked with Ron Scott, who was a co-founder of that party. And I learned so much about how the uh, political empowerment of the black working class was really at the center of transforming <coughs> this country. And it's really that—it was that political empowerment of labor, civil rights, and the black community that really marked Detroit to be a target for uh, a right-wing counter-revolution. You mentioned Grace Lee Boggs. In 2007, Juan and I spoke to Detroit activist and philosopher Grace Lee Boggs and the late poet and activist Amiri Baraka. Uh, from Newark to talk about the 40th anniversary of those two rebellions in Detroit and Newark. Mary, well, what has changed in the, in, uh, in these 40 years in terms of uh, consciousness and in terms of what the country has learned from that period? Well, actually, in some ways, we've gone full cycle, but up to another level. I mean, uh, we went from the kind of uh, blatant brutalization of white supremacy and racism. Uh, we then organized ourselves and elected two black mayors. We haven't—none of my children, for instance, have ever grown under white people ruling in Newark. They don't even know what that is, you understand? And so we can be proud of that. But at the same time, after we had our two domestic kind of mayors who compromised relentlessly with corporate power, you understand? Now we've come full Amir, circle and let come Let me ask to, you a question, Amir. Yeah. Do you think that we have uh, challenged and criticized and evaluated black power sufficiently? Have we? No. no but I've been doing it for—I'm sorry. Gonna, I've, when are we going to do it? 
Uh, well, I've been doing it for uh, almost 37 years. I mean, having two black mayors there, Sharp James and uh, Ken Gibson, I was probably their most relentless critic all the time. But now we have somebody who doesn't compromise with corporate power, but who represents it. So that's the difference. Well, we so move. Do you, think it, do you think it's a question of changing an individual, you know, so say from changing no, you from have to Gibson, get an individual who's Gibson willing to, to change Boca? the system? You have to get an individual who's willing to actually struggle with the system to change it. As long as you have people who... I mean, what do we mean by struggling with the system? How... What are we to going make, to be... To sort of, make substantive changes, to make infrastructure no, the, changes. Uh, what, are we, what are we going to understand that we have to create new infrastructures, Yeah, but new you can only do that educated. through people, you see. No, uh, but, 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 but you're not going to do it from people at the top. We're going to well, do it from people at the Well, you have to bottom. mobilize the whole community, but what, we, what I'm saying is the people no, at I the mean, top became uh, accommodated to being in power uh, may, and not maybe changing what we've done, Maybe what we've done, yes, but you see, we put so much emphasis on taking over the power structure and we became prisoners of it. So that was Grace Lee Boggs um, speaking from Detroit. And Mary Baracco talked about his two kids not growing up under white leadership in Newark. And ha now one of those children, Ross Baracca, is the mayor of Newark. But Scott Kurashige, as you listen to that and you mentioned the issue of counter revolution just before we went to this clip, um, if you can address those issues. Well, it's, it's important to point out, of course, that the right to vote. Uh, has only been recognized by the nation as something that applies to African Americans since 1965. Now, uh, Detroit, of course, had its first black mayor uh, in the 1970s, and this was really the product of the struggles that people had. Um, but what happened uh, after 1967 was the Kerner Commission, as you mentioned previously, they effectively called for a domestic Marshall Plan, unprecedented investments in employment, education, housing and social welfare. What we got instead was not a war on poverty, but a right-wing shift towards a war on crime and really a war on working-class people. And Detroit is really, again, so in some ways symbolic of that. So the uh, empowerment of African Americans in the election of, of black mayors in cities like Detroit was really undermined by these economic shifts and by the shift in political power from the cities uh, to the suburbs. Reagan, of course, played a central role in that. And it really leads us, in many ways, not just to Trump 50 years later, but to the state takeover, the bankruptcy and the rule of Detroit by an emergency manager appointed by the Republicans in state government in Michigan to have uh, unchallenged power over the city, not just finances, but all aspects of social policy in the city. And Detroit, even though it's nominally got its elected government back, is handcuffed to these right-wing policies for the next 13 years. So, with this counter-revolution, the right-wing was able to accomplish in Detroit something they could have never achieved through democratic means, and, which is and, to— And, yeah. and Scott Kershiga, uh, we got about a minute left. I wanted to ask yeah. you about the current—the the narrative now of the Renaissance in Detroit, despite the fact that between 2011 and 2015, one in four uh, home mortgages in Detroit were foreclosed. Uh, there, uh, other people are talking about that there is a Renaissance going on. Could you talk about the class nature of that Renaissance? Sure. Some people say that the bankruptcy was a bailout and it's led to this comeback. What the bankruptcy did was it imposed extreme austerity measures, privatization and anti-union members on a city. Again, that's over 90 percent people of color. The prime example of what's happened in Detroit is the dismantling of the public school system, uh, in many ways championed by Betsy DeVos, who's now brought this agenda to the national level as secretary of education. Um, and Detroit uh, is in many ways now the subject of massive subsidies for billionaires to redevelop downtown, but the neighborhoods themselves are being hit hard. $250 million, which was supposed to go towards helping homeowners deal with foreclosure uh, and, you know, mortgage uh, problems, instead went towards demolishing homes and making it, uh, you know, less livable in so many neighborhoods. And Larry Ham yes. in Newark, what we're seeing today and what you think needs to be done? Well, I think to a greater or lesser degree, what we what has been described as taking place in Detroit is taking place in Newark and in urban areas all around the country. Yes, there was a uh, right wing counter revolution. I think we could benchmark it with the election of Richard Nixon. 
1968. We haven't had a coherent urban policy in the United States for 50 years. Uh, in fact, what we've actually had is the disinvestment in our urban areas, uh, massive cutbacks in urban aid, uh, the rollback ending of uh, many of the programs that came out of the war on poverty of the 1960s. What we need now is a new movement, a new movement to save our urban areas. Of course, I agree with the uh, demand for urban Marshall Plan, but there are a number of prerequisites that must be met before that. We're not going to get anything out of this federal government, not with this right-wing death grip that they have on the federal government. We have to get Trump out of there. We have to get these right-wing people out of the national government, and we got to put people in who will actually put forward a progressive policy in the urban Marshall Plan. We're going to have to leave it there, but, of course, the discussion will continue. I want to thank Larry Hamm of the People's Organization for Progress and Scott Kurashige. His book, The 50-Year Rebellion, brand new. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.